Hi, I'm Doug Vo from the Daiho Foundation, and this is video series 11, part 3, on the judges period and uh, all the way to David, King David. And this is what I'm going to cover. <coughs> Dating of the period, the war with the tribe of Benjamin, why the separate prophet's name, you know, they basically had three names. Uh, the only fictional character in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, King Saul and what he forced the priest class to do, namely tell the truth. What an original idea. And David's family line. Uh, again, this is, what you're going to see here is how one lie will uh, accumulate and cause problems throughout history. And that's really what you're looking at here. So let's get to it. <clears throat> Again, uh, volume three is on the Exodus and covers it in, deep, uh, in, in depth. This is where I figured it all out, uh, including the alphabet and stuff like that, uh, and Moses' code systems. In fact, Unless you know this, you cannot figure out really what they're talking about. There's no way. It is that code of the secret. And this is really the book I'm, I'm going through. Uh, by the way, for those who are only like my science stuff and the polarversal, when I get done with this series, I'll go back to it. Okay, this is what Moses was hiding. Not only what Joseph did by taking so much of that gold and silver for the sale of the wheat and, rye, uh, and grain products, but all of these from Ephraim all the way down, including his brother, never gave up the gold and silver that was put into the family burial cave uh, to free the other 11 tribes would then became 10 tribes. As I explained in the previous video, um, the tribe of Levi really disappeared. Levi would have only seen his grandsons. After that, they disappeared. Anyway, this, this is the, the family's deep, dark secret. All of them never gave up the goal. Remember, Aaron met Moses when Moses went back to the hill. Why? He was picking up some gold and silver from the family bank. Nobody can deny that. Okay, the next thing is, I was really curious why the word levy is Lamed Vav Yud. Now originally the Yud looked very much like the, the Vav, but I had figured out Moses' uh, creation of the Hebrew alphabet where these letters uh, appeared and how they look. So I was kind of curious. You know, Moses had total control over the alphabet. He could have made what's now Lamed. It could have been an M. Could have been an N. Could be anything he wanted. But so I wanted to find out how many times the word Levi appeared. It was 128 times in the Torah. So then I started looking at Vav and Yud, and that was 40, over 4,300 times. That's a lot for a, color, for a letter combination. And many times, it was actually over 778. But when you search, if the Allah saw in the next line, the next verse, it didn't show up. But it's at least that many times with the olive at the end of it. So I wanted to see what these letters formed. Because really, remember, on the second lunar year, the 47th day, he pulled out two special, uh, I can't call them tablets. Uh, really, more accurately, they would be polycarbonates with the Torah as we know it. And it, was, it had 304,805 symbols on it. 
It wasn't the, the two stone, one of the stone tablets that they got a month after they arrived at, at uh, Mount Sinai, which his brother broke. And I showed it in the previous video. We're, in other words, we're dealing with two different documents, not one. That's what, that, I can't understand why the scholars couldn't figure this one out. You know, it, it was, to me, pretty obvious. Now, anyway, the vault winds up over here. Uh, you go counterclockwise around it, and it's 270 mark. And I, I have my model here. That's where you see the vav. And that's what it looked like. Originally, not this apostrophe we have now. now but I, I think they, they had a problem with the yod. Now, I'll get out of the way here. The lamed and the, va, uh, and the yod is basically on the side. It would be the top and the bottom. Now, what do the, the sloping sides represent? They represent carrier waves. And the way we figured it out was the angle of it is 1 over the square root of E gives you 52.66 degrees. That's just about the real angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's only off by, I think, four or six tenths of a, uh, of a degree, you know, hundredths of a degree. So, uh, Anyway, now there's eight pyramids. The, the le four least used letters in the Torah are just form a pyramid. And they're offset by 45 degrees. So when you look down at the top of it, you see the Mandela, which shows up in, uh, in the Orient, Middle East, all over. When you read what the Mandela represents, it's almost a mirror of what I'm saying basically the creation of the universe. So oh, we have a carrier wave and down here, and I, I had thought that we're dealing with a light-based computer. That's what this program is. So the question is, is it possible if you phase the light 90 degrees out of phase from each other, can you run four independent processes on the same uh, hardware at the same time? Maybe that's what it's telling us. Uh, anyway, um, so and that, and with the Aleph is over here, again, below the line. So it means something. Now, I'm, I'm going to do a video on some other things I've discovered with the alphabet that have to do with all the natural elements in the periodic table. It'll be surprising for most of you. Okay, what does it mean when the, the, the resh crosses the x-axis, the, the vav rather crosses the x-axis? It creates a spike of energy, or what we call matter, but it's really not matter, it's, it's information. On a gross scale, that's what's going on with, with quasars. You have two jets, 180 degrees opposite each other, just like this. And it's pouring out, not dust. Any astronomer says it's dust that coagulates and basically becomes a star is an idiot. You can't see dust from 50, 100 uh, million or a billion light years away. And that's what we're seeing these things. You're looking at stars pouring out of a center modulation point. So anyway. The other thing I left out in the previous um, video, part two, on what anybody, what you'll see if you go on the expedition. By the way, the expedition, I, I said in the other video, made 10,000 bucks. I looked at what it cost last time. <coughs> it's closer to about 4,000. Anyway, uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac dug a... a a well. This is the name of the well. And lo and behold, I found the well south of the hill 
the better ones are using it. And that's it. So the story is, is correct. Everything that's in the Torah about the real Mount Sinai, not the crap you've seen before, um, is there. And I showed it. This is some of the crap I told you about. Um, the one I left out is R Raphadim. I showed Marsh, Elam, where they, they camp near the uh, shore and the wilderness of Sin. So what I left out in my haste last time, oh, by the way, this is Sin Bashar, which, which means the wilderness of Sin, and this is it. There's two passes that go into the interior of the Sinai. This is one of them. The, the yellow here is, is wells. And at the end, I showed in the previous video, is the Battle of Malak, which they conveniently leave out. What I didn't go into, Jabril Raha. So Moses called this mountain range Rafa Din. So, um, my 2002 expedition to the Sinai, to this area, um, our driver was Izzet, and um, I asked him, what in Arabic is, would Rafadin mean? And he said, imagine you have diarrhea, and you've shit it all out, and you're totally empty. That's Rafadin. So what it told me is that Moses had a sense of humor. He had shit out Egypt. He was done with it, never wanted to look back. The, the guy who thought Rafadim is in uh, Saudi Arabia, he knows nothing. Except he knows how to collect money from unsuspecting good Christians. Anyway, now we get to the... the, the, the the Nuts and Bolts. Um, who authored the uh, book Judges? It would never have been written if it wasn't for Saul. Saul, and you'll find out why, he wanted the, he was forcing the priest class to tell the truth and the missing history of what they did. Now the period is from the death of Joshua who was the great-grandson of Moses, I showed. And uh, it also showed why this war with Benjamin. And that was it. Okay, the first is determining how many years is the judges period from the death of Joshua. Now they have a long story in here about uh, a judge and then the oppressors. Midianites or Canaan, Moab, etc. Now, you see the 40, 80, 40, and 40? They're coded numbers. If you saw the video or bought the book, Moses' Ten Code Systems, it represents chapter 37, 3, 23, and 33. It's every place where it's mentioned the coat of many colors that Jacob gave Joseph. It wasn't if you take the words apart, you realize it's a golden calf. It's the golden idols, fertility idol, that Jacob's lovely wife stole from Laban, her father. Of course, God paid her back during giving birth to Benjamin. She died. Like I've said many times, never piss off the operating system of the universe. If he wants to, something done that way, Leave it, don't question it. Anyway, going through the whole thing, uh, if you took the surface, sorry, be 413 years, some had 414. I came up with 179.42. Uh, Oxford University in England also say 180 years. So we're right and I don't even know if anyone's trying to figure it out anyway. Okay, the priest class during the, the, this period, um, basically the priest would sit in front of the ark 
and God would choose who was going to be the judge, and then finally he'd anoint the judge, and they'd be a judge for a period of time. And basically, God was their king. God, through the ark, this is my interpretation after reading this stuff carefully, and I think I'm the only one who figured out they built a flame speaker, and that's why the thing made such a noise and talked. So anyway, uh, that's how the whole thing worked. The judge would listen to whatever the priest told him. Theoretically, the priest told the truth and told the judge what to do. When God was saying, here's the, the, pro the proof of it within the Torah. Um, Again, the story of Gideon. Gideon was one of the, the uh, judges. I will not rule over you, uh, over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall be rule over you. Um, judges 19.18. And the Lord said unto Samuel. Now this is already at the end. When the end of Judges period. When the, they were fighting the Philistines. And they, people wanted to have a king. They thought that was going to be better. So, hearken to the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not be king over them. And then Samuel says, But the, the king shall reign over, uh, over us, when the Lord your God was your king. So, you have to understand the humor here. <clears throat> now, theoretically, there's a, a legend in one of the later prophets that uh, God is going to rule over them again. We assume it's just the, the state of Israel. I'll tell you, if the ark was found, the group that would most likely not accept it and run away would be the political elites in Israel. They wouldn't want to give up power. They never do. Uh, both the liberal, the ultra left, definitely. And the other ones, I don't know about the religious groups, whether they would accept it. Anyway, that's the proofs. Imagine today uh, if a country had the ark, and all of a sudden their king, you know, the political structure is done with, or lower uh, echelons of it, and another country is trying to negotiate with the, that country and say, your king is the operating system of the universe. How do you argue with that? How do you negotiate with it? You really can't. The only way you can be sure the high priest was to create a genealogical bar chart. I had to do this. Now, in, um, in Exodus it says, you're an adult at 20 years old. So I assume, I made the assumption that they got married, an arranged marriage, and at, the guy was 20 years old, and the woman didn't have to be 20. And they married him off. So, uh, and also, I discovered that they, were, they had three different names. They had a given name at birth, then they had a priestly name um, after they got them being a scribe. Uh, in the later books, they say they're a scribe. That's their given name. And then you had, uh, when they became a priest, it was usually a combination of two or more words stuck together. And then finally, if they were in front of the ark and they took dictation or wrote, they would adopt a prophet's name. Now, the reason they did that was many strong countries around them, Egypt and Syria and later Babylon. They didn't want anyone to know how this thing really worked. In fact, what I can tell they didn't tell anybody, only the, the priest class. And even some of them didn't believe it. Maybe God didn't talk to them. 
that's one of the problems. Nobody knew what, the, what they really had. This is what the bar got. Now this is, there's three of them in the book. There's, uh, I reproduced them in color. And this is the only way you can really figure out who's who in the zoo, who's still alive when, when uh, the books were written. Anyway, this is the traditional um, uh, family chart of Eliezer, supposedly Phineas, going all the way down. This is basically, uh, all this is wrong. From here down, all wrong. And you're missing two, three, four, five generations here. And Samuel 1.1 1, 1 gives us this. Now, uh, nowhere in the entire scriptures did any writer provide us the descendants of Ish I Ishamar. Only in, uh, in the legends, some priest figured out the same thing I did. So, the other part is, supposedly, these are the sons of Aaron, but the problem is, he's 84 years old. I estimate these guys were born 1313 BCE. This is born 1306 BCE. He's probably the one that was one month old. So, they're little kids. Chances are, these two are the sons of one of these two, or even their sons, sons, but the Torah doesn't tell us, so we don't know for sure. But that's one of the problems we're dealing with here. Phineas was the son of Eliezer. He was the high priest after Joshua died, and Ezra gives, uh, gave, included the, the priestly names uh, of, of that Uzi, a.k.a. Uzil, Zechariah, uh, etc. Samuel gives us the given names. Uh, and only through Tohu. So that's how you piece the thing together. But nobody mentions um, um, Ithamar at all. First Samuel, uh, which is back in uh, Zuf, uh, absolutely no one mentions Zufa Tohu as priest. You would think everyone would have tried to show they found me a uh, thing, uh, except Ezra. That's after they, they came back from Babylon, it was already a dead issue. Phineas, the son of Eliezer, uh, was still high priest at the time when this battle or war with Benjamin happened. And um, why did it happen? Um, one of the things I think, we know Levi is probably the one by the supposed blessing, but uh, Jacob gave um, uh, Levi. He was a murderer or a vicious guy. The, the other one is Benjamin. So why did Joseph not make Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, his bondsman? Maybe ben, uh, Benjamin, being the younger brother, thought, okay, if Joseph is gone or dead, I'm going to get twice the inheritance. And that nice shiny golden calf also. So he, maybe the other tribes asked him, as the brother, what do you want to do with your brother? Either he said, kill him or sell him off. So I think Joseph learned this after they came back. And he decided to, okay, I'm going to make my younger brother a bondsman too, which meant, uh, eventually meant he became a slave.
Okay, the story begins in chapter 7, 17. Uh, it took place further back in time than the beginning of uh, uh, when the ark was in Shiloh, and that's where the high priests were. And the priest's name was Uzi Ozil. His given name was Jonathan. And born about 1248 BCE. Um, uh, his father was not the high priest. So this guy had to go find a, a tribe, which I think was the tribe of Dan, that needed a priest. And he found one. Um, okay, so this guy, Jonathan, he took a concubine. Um, didn't marry her, just took a concubine. And she played the harlot uh, uh, against him. Okay, she was a little loose of a woman. Some of us could relate to that. <clears throat> oh, they mentioned came from Bethlehem. Now remember, all of this in Judges would never have been written if it wasn't for Saul forcing him to write this. They stayed in a town of Gilead, Gilead, uh, which belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. And supposedly that night, he's with the concubine, staying with an old man who has a daughter. And some base fellows surrounded the house and demanded they know him, uh, meaning they wanted to have sex with him. Now, I don't believe that story. One, in the Torah, homosexuality was not tolerated. The homosexuals were basically killed. And that may be their excuse for, on the surface story, why it's okay to wind up wiping out the whole tribe. But, so I don't think that's what happened. Besides, uh, what happened next, he winds up throwing his, his concubine to the fellows out there. And the next morning, they find her silent, which means implying she was dead. Now, if they're true homosexuals, they're not interested in, in a woman. They may talk about fashions. Gee, where did you get the rags on your back? Nice sandals, but they are like a killer. So I don't believe the story. But remember, it's the Ephraimites writing this. Anyway, so what he does, after he got back, back to Shiloh, where the, the ark was, so we know he's a priest, he cut her body into 12 pieces and sent it off to the 12 tribes, <coughs> where they wound up doing war against Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. And um, later, and you'll find this in Judges 20, 27 to 28, uh, the children of Israel asked the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, God was in those days, and Phinehas, he's the high priest, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days saying, Shall I yet go out to battle with the children of Benjamin, my brother? Well, if they were Levites, Benjamin was not his brother. Joseph's brother was Benjamin. So, again, Saul forced them, in essence, to show they're really Ephraimites and not Levites at all. <clears throat> During this leave of time, the annual, uh, it was an annual holiday. Now, it's either um, Passover or Day of Atonement. Um, and everybody was supposed to go down to, I guess, Jerusalem or somebody, someplace at the time. And, and 
uh, they didn't. Of course, they just had been mauled to death, and I don't know how many of them were still alive. And their oath was, anybody who doesn't, doesn't go to the holiday should get killed. So again, 12,000 men uh, go and smite the inhabitants of Gilad with the edge of the sword with the women and the children. I think Phineas basically was a, he made this stuff up. We know that components of one story spread across both books. For example, in Judges, we learn that 600 Benjamins, uh, Benjamite uh, men hid themselves in a cave. In 1 Samuels, we read that King Saul had 600 men with him. They were going after David to kill him. That's called payback. <clears throat> Legend of the Jews, Lewis Ginsburg. That's where you'll find it in that area. It talks about a rivalry between Phineas and one other, some young man. And the other person involved in the story is this guy. And he died a horrible death. Limb by limb, his body was dismembered. Gee, just like the concubine. So one is pointing back at the other story. That's how they do it. And this is the part. Uh, high priest, the Holy Spirit departed from him. In other words, God said, I'm not talking to you anymore. Goodbye. And that was the end of his line. Um, now, this is funny. In his office, high priest Eli, Eli who, uh, was a successor to no less than a personage than Phineas. That's impossible because over 230 years difference between the birth of Phineas and the birth of Elihu. They never met. <clears throat> With Eli, the line of Ithamar rose to the power instead of the line of Eliezer. Now, it's a high pri a priest who's writing this. He had figured the same thing I did. That really is the line of Ithamar. That's the line of the priests, not, not the other one. Um, no place in the Torah, in the Old Testament, does it say that Elihu was related to Ithamar. Nowhere. This is the correct lineage. Phineas. It ended there. And this is the correct uh, lineage. This part here, like I said earlier, was given to us by uh, uh, Ezra after the temple fell and they were back in Jerusalem. This is, this is the, the, these are the priests during the judges period up to Samuel. What they give a name their priestly name, and they had a prophet's name. These prophets, we don't have any record of their writings. Either it just didn't survive. We have Samuels, but um, I know there was, if you've seen my, my stuff on video series 12 on the Pisos, part two, the Pisos and the rabbis at Yavna made a deal. There wouldn't be any more than 24,136 chapters and verses in the Hebrew scriptures. And that included Piso's writings that they put in, as well as the, the rabbi's later writings. And that's what happened. That may be why any writings by them disappeared. <clears throat> Judges, the story began about a man in the hill country of Ephraim called Micah. His mother was robbed of 1,100, uh, 1100 pieces of silver. And here it gives us Bethlehem Jonathan. 
That's how we know this is the guy. Samson, in the Samson story, the Samson story is the only fictional character I was able to f figure out. It's a combination of the Ark and Samuel. And his youngest son, Abatar, is the one who's writing it. This is after you know, the father was dead. 85 of the members of his family were all killed by Saul. Anyway, um, so in the story of Samson, uh, again, the Delilah was offered 1,100 pieces of silver from the five Philistine lords to basically cut his hair off. Abitur wrote chapters 13 through 16 in Judges. That's uh, Samuel's youngest surviving son. All the rest died, or I should say murdered. Next one in the Hebrew scriptures is 1 Samuel. Uh, it's also written by, some of it by Samuel up to the point where he dies, but, and his son uh, finishes the book. Uh, but what's interesting, um, Saul was still king, but they couldn't kill him they ran out of priests to sit in front of the ark, and they needed, someone, they needed someone to sit in front of the ark to get messages from God, so they left him alive. Okay. Um, okay. This is an act of God, what you're looking at here. When, when God told Samuel you're going to give them a king, and he chose the king, and God did. And what happened was Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin, from the town of Gilead, about 173 years after the disaster that had befallen the tribe of Benjamin. So that's called revenge. Now really, God wanted the Ephraimites to come clean already and admit your Ephraimites and what happened. There's no reason to keep this fraud going, this lie going. <clears throat> Saul did something wrong in the eyes of God. The only thing he did wrong, it wasn't in the eyes of God, because God chose him to do this, was that he was revealing what that the, there were no Levites, they were all, uh, the priests were all Ephraimites. Okay, so, but this is what the surface story says, the eyes of God. So Samuel told, told by God to anoint David, the son of Jesse, as the next king. Saul saw this appointment as an attempt of the uh, Ephraimites priests to grab power. Remember, uh, Eli, Elihu was a judge, so he was high priest and he was administrator. They loved power. The results that Saul so constantly tried to kill David, after the incident was uh, help David, King Saul instructed the Edomite guards to kill all of Samuel's family. They managed to kill 85 men, women, and children similar to what the Ephraimites did the Benjaminites. Only Samuel's youngest son, Abitar, escaped with, with David. Um, Samuel 1.1. 1, 1. This is the big sin. Here it is right here. Now, it goes through a certain man of blah, 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 the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. That's here. Oh, sorry. Elkanah is um, Samuel's given name for his father. Son of Jehoam. Son of Elihu. Son of Tohu. Son of Zuf. 
and Ephraimite. That's the only sin that Saul did in the eyes of these, these priest class. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you something interesting. No one knew uh, Abdul or Eli had two sons. One was a degenerate. He was too busy screwing the women in the temple. <clears throat> uh, one was Yaka and the other was Boaz. And uh, so anyway, um, nobody knew these names. They knew this one. No one knew this one. I figured it out. When uh, Solomon built the temple, he had two bronze pillars in front of the temple door. Now, they didn't show this thing high enough. They were 18 cubits. As you know, I discovered the length of a sacred cubit, which is 24.136 inches. And that means that they were 36 feet high. That's pretty big and solid bronze uh, or brass. Anyway, this one was called Yachin and this one was called Boaz. And no one ever figured out where they got the names from. Well, this is the foundation of one became the line of kings and the other one became the line of priest class. That's what it was. They did not figure this stuff out. <clears throat> Ithamar, from my priest class, through his grandfather, Hophni, the oldest son of Elihu. So here's the line. Uh, Jesse is David's father. His priest name was Dodo. This is this, one of the sons of Jesse, who got the ark, by the way. Uh, his son was Aho, Eliezer, proper name Gad. Gad was the personal seer for David, which you're going to see right now. It'll end all dates whether these people are Levites or, or uh, Ephraimites. And here's the line for David. Hophni, Hophni, Jesse, David. This is his real name, Jesse's real name. And sorry, Jesse's real name and David's real name. And this is how you figure it out. Again, now David was the son of that Ephraimite of Bethlehem uh, in Judah, whose name was Jesse. So identify them real good, they're Ephraimites. Second Samuel. The most family story about David is killing Goliath. Well, they described Goliath, the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Second Samuel, they repeat the story, and they say, and there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. What names they come up with? Elihana, the son of Jari, ooh, I can't pronounce this. The Bethlehemite slew Goliath at Gidi the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, it's a technique, one of the code systems that Moses used. If A is equal to B, and B is equal to C, therefore A is equal to C. So now you understand how they're writing. So that's how I knew this was Jesse's given name, and this was David's given name at birth. Abinadad was the second eldest son of Jesse. By the way, this is where it gets funny. If you have any doubts that I'm right, that, that these people are all Ephraimites, this is where it will all disappear. Chapter 7, 1, 1 Samuel. It informs us that after the ark was returned by the Philistines, the men of, I can't pronounce that, came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab in the hill. 
and sacrificed and sanctified Eliezer, his son. There. Abinadab is the son of, and notice this is his, Jesse's grandson. Uh, uh, Eliezer, keep the ark. We are told the ark resided with him for over 20 years. Uh, his son Uzzah later died when David had the ark moved, carried to Jerusalem. So in other words, here's David, and this is a, a nephew of his, basically. Um, Samuel died and all Israel gathered and lamented with him, buried him in the house of Ramah, and David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. If you remember my uh, volume two stuff, or volume three on the Exodus, Paran was a coded name. It means Mount Sinai. David and his whole family escaped to the cave of, of Dulam. Again, code systems. You take the word apart and it means to learn about eternity. Gee, that's a funny name for a cave. Yeah, right. It's Mount Sinai, the cave of the base. <coughs> and then there was, after Saul was, after the whole family wanted to kill him, they went down to Mount Sinai, went into the cave, and they stayed there for an indeterminate period of time until God told them to leave. And it was Gad, who's David's nephew, uh, is the one who said, get the hell out of here. Abide not in the stronghold. Depart and get ye into the land of Judah. You can't make this stuff up. It's, it's just too good. David's personal seer, then David rose up in the morning and the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, okay, and David knew that Saul was dividing mischief against him. So Abatar, which is Samuel's youngest son, he's the high priest, bring hither the ephod. The ephod was the breastplate with the four with the uh, 12 stones on it that the priest wore in front of the ark. So the high priest is giving him the ephod so David can sit in front of the ark and talk to God. It happens again in Samuel 37, 8. And David said to Abitar the priest, the son of Amalek, Samuel, I pray thee, bring me hither the afford. Is there any doubt? Besides, his family had the ark for 20 years. Then they're schlepping it from Jerusalem or wherever, probably Hebron, down to the real Mount Sinai in the cave to escape the wrath of Saul, which told me Saul did not know where the real Mount Sinai was or the cave was. They figure it was safe there. I told you, they don't tell anybody about this stuff. Only within the family. And that's what happened. So, there should be no doubt the Ephraimites were the priest class. There were no Levites. They were all dead during the period of slavery in Egypt. <coughs> Done. The lesson here is this. The lie that Moses instituted uh, has affected hundreds of years after the fact. And it will keep haunting them. And the next video will be on how, during the time of Solomon, and how they tried to get out from under it by giving the high priest two identities and his sons two identities. I don't think anybody had figured this stuff out. Why? The great, in, the great tradition God 
known as the Hulaka God, overcame thinking and critical thinking. And that's the problem here. We're stuck with this lie. Now, I'm doing these videos. I'm not here to destroy the Jewish religion. I'm here to fix it because it's the only one that's fixable. I've already covered in video series 12, parts one and two, what the Pisos did. Basically, they created and wrote the New Testament. Uh, that and have had on the Karayish family who tried to stop the spread of Christianity in the Arabian Peninsula, and they had a holy book written. Their problem was they had to wind up kidnapping a Jewish rabbi from Yemen, an Armenian monk, and they inserted no less than 10 of Piso's fictional characters in the story. So what could possibly go wrong? Uh, Hinduism, I've read all of it. When I did my first book, Reality Revealed, it's just pure idolatry. I understand what the far sages did, but it, it was a mistake what they did. And Taoism and Confucianism doesn't allow for a supreme being, a god. So it's like cause and effect, ancestor worship. It, it, it's not the truth. Now you understand why you, our civilization, no matter what country you're from and religion or race you are, we are 23 years from this polar reversal. Sometime between September and December 2046. The Torah gives a, a date of October 16th, 2046. If you've seen my, uh, my videos on Senate Bill 4488, the Defense the uh, intelligence uh, agency agrees with me. They know what's going to happen. It's not a pretty picture. But the human race deserves to know why we are in the position we're in. Like I said, it's like swimming through an ocean of lies. And the lies have to end. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something.